Mono Society was there and created such a statement nearly every evening on St. Charles Avenue. She was a good looker, stylish, of good family, and so on, but it's inclined to be mannish. She can ride a tricycle, but that style of locomotion is too slow, even for her. So she has secured herself a bicycle on which she appears and certainly creates a sensation, especially when there is a breeze <laughs> that displays a tendency to play that habit on the folds of her drapery. Everybody knows her, so that is hardly necessary to mention her name. <laughs> The people of New Orleans every once in a while get clear gone crazy over something or other at some particular time in popularity with the masses. The people went crazy over baseball two years ago and made such a fuss over the players of the home club that the aforesaid players got an exceedingly bad attack of swelling of the cranium from which they have never yet recovered and which have made them worthless to themselves or anybody else for that matter. <laughs> New Orleans has got another craze in its bonnet just now, and one that will take it some time to knock out. This particular craze at the present time is pugilism. And that fever has caught on so bad that wherever one goes, he is sure to hear something about the sluggers or see someone also slug. The great fight will take place shortly, almost within a week, and after it, after it, the people will make a popular idol of the winner. Whether it's Sullivan or Kilray matters really little. It will be fought somewhere within 200 miles of the city where no one but those directly interested will even know. It is to be hoped that everything will be conducted in an orderly manner and that nothing will be done to give a bad reputation to New Orleans or to any of its sporting people. With the advent of the pugilists, it is hoped that even the kids will sigh for a pair of gloves and the wife who waits up until the wee small hours for her husband, who is a lover of this manly art, will go for him with her bare knuckles and will knock him out before he can cry for the police. <laughs> In the meantime, there are several smaller affairs on the tapas, which it is reported will be well patronized. <laughs> the tendency of the matrimonial market at this time is a thing which agitates the minds of many, and the alarm is so rapidly extending along the line that it has struck sable age as well as youth. The parents and grandparents of marriageable girls are beginning to sympathize with the damsels as they stand before the mirror for three hours each evening trying to hide blemishes in their complexions and arranging their headgear in the hope that something about them might attract the attention of a man. Oh, a man, a man, anything for a man, some man, any man, <laughs> is the sentiment of our girl population today. There never was, so it is quoted at the women's club, such a depression in the matrimonial market. And, by express, observe our deplorable condition, the picture on the last page. The picture looks terrible, but the actual thing is worse. See the lonely wanderer in the dim distance. See the anxiety in the faces of the dozen girls when a tip is given that a man, any man, a real live man, is in sight. The time has come when we must collar a man or eat grass. We must say a word to those fortunate girls who have caught on and have prospects. Treat him with care. Have fine cigarettes at your home to give him when he comes. Treat him to a cup of hot chocolate. Hear us. If you lose him, you will never get another. <laughs> These few remarks, girls, we leave you weeping. Bag and baggage. Hell hath no fury like a woman scorned and disdaining originally referring to women whose love has been disguised by men. But women scorned by women are equally furious. At least one who lives on the show near Jackson Street seemed the other day to be so. For years, she and another woman, both presumably respectable, had dwelt together in one house. They had exchanged little feminine confidences, told one another their love secrets, together torn to tatters the reputations of their neighbors. In short, they were as intimate as two women can ever be. I know. Like ten fertile doves, they dwelt together and would doubtless have done so forever had Cupid not entered the household and brought jealousy as his companion. Every morning, their milk was brought to the door by an old man. One day, a good-looking young man took his place. Both noted his handsome, healthy appearance, both fell in love with him, and thereafter, they had a race. Every morning, to get up early and take milk from the young man. <laughs> After a few days of silent rivalry, they fell out about matter and had a stormy time. 
each of you that are afraid of being sent there as a lack of will. Your words are succeeded by blows and scratchings. The one who held the least first will cover your breath. She drew herself up with an air of dignity and bade the others leave the house at once. Being met with a mocking laugh, she recommenced the fight, overcame her adversary, and thrust her out the door. Then she took her wardrobe and threw it after her. Petticoats, chemise, bustles, shoes, stockings, hairpins, hats, bodice and skirts, umbrellas, parasols, false teeth, and many other articles of feminine attire hurled through the air. <laughs> Mrs. Jackson, not content with her prosperity in the sweet place for burning lovers, she sought to add a voodoo clinic to the ranch and accordingly formed the acquaintance of a Dr. James Alexander, who it is said possessed his charms and influences by which wickedly legs and crooked backs are made to grow and become better than they were, but originally attached to the citizen whose duty it was to carry them about for a living here on the earth. <laughs> After completing the organization of his troop, the doctor got down to perfecting his performers in the voodoo vagaries and flip-flap. What our young man saw in that house on the day of the grand finale and on previous occasions can, according to his way of thinking, be only seen once in a lifetime. He says that the hog face was danced on Franklin Street by the roustabouts and the lewd, dusty dames before an audience of gentlemen slumming, as is frequently the case when the city is crowded during the Mardi Gras festivities, is only a tame thing compared to the contortions and capers in the grand flurry flurry act as executed by Dr. Alexander and his troop. The reader will please understand that I did not dance or in any way mingle with these angels. I simply took in the show from a recess in which I was observed. I asked if the young white women joined the organization and intended to revolutionize the can can biz, and I was told that some of them were patients and others had a notion to communicate with old Satan on the question of how best to make life easy, force truant lovers back to their gruel, and perform other wonderful feats. <clears throat> well, what is the matter with that one, I asked, and the reply came, she is troubled with fallen stockings. <laughs> the second angel is in trouble with her husband because she can't have children. And so my informant continued to satisfy my curiosity, going along the line, pointing out those disappointed in love, others who had too much love, scarcity of hair, drunken husbands, and the like. Uh, while the inharmonious and discordant sounds filled the place, the colored men and women would divest themselves of each piece of wardrobe until they presented a picture that would sell for a dollar and a half a copy. <laughs> <laughs> the grand high priest would observe some of the white sisters still togged up, and advice would be given to disrobe and to appear in the condition required by him who rules all things and must be obeyed, meaning their god, I presume. Uh, some of the white women would then reluctantly take off their top clothes, appearing in their unmentionable piece of wardrobe, others insisting on retaining their corsets and petticoats. A few of them, with bad cases, unceremoniously, unceremoniously hung all their clothes on nails and went right on in to get the cure there might be in any method. Uh, those who did not take kindly to the custom of skiing off at first were advised to do so by the sisters who had been there and found that relief came much swifter when the affected part was exposed during the ceremony. <laughs> And it was surprising to see with what immodesty and coolness they entered into the racket at their second visit to the chapel. And that all the women, though some of them were attractive, as a general thing, they exhibited ignorance and absolutely no education. In conclusion, I will say that if the show is reproduced at the lake next month, there will be 50,000 people in attendance. <laughs> The percentage of booze-saturated masqueraders was greater than observed here for many years. It seems to be the general feeling that there could be no fun for a man or woman behind the mask unless some stimulants were applied. Consequently, the crowd voted in favor of booze, and everyone seemed to live up to the resolution. Before the day had advanced, drunken masqueraders were numerous and made themselves repugnant to the people who lined the banquettes to see the parade of wrecks. There was a degree of immodesty exhibited by nearly all the female masqueraders seen on the streets, 
It seemed that nearly every woman in town who has a nice shape or uniformly nice limbs was out displaying her attractive qualities. <laughs> and in any, many cases, their conduct was disgraceful. This disgraceful scene was enacted at the corner of Canal and Bourbon Streets. Just an hour of day when the streets were crowded with home people and strangers. It seems that the crowd of women who created the stampede in question came rushing up to the above corner regardless of the pleasure or convenience of others and pushing right and left made a general disturbance. When remonstrated by the police, they only became furious and elevated their voices to such a tone that they were placed under arrest. At this juncture, the scene became disgusting. The women rolled around on the banquettes with clothes uplifted and scratching and biting the officers. <laughs> Finally, the belligerent females were overpowered and waltzed to the jail. Such scenes as this only tend to deprave the carnival, and the greatest precaution should be taken by the authorities in the future to prevent such scenes coming under the observation of strangers to our own respectable people. 